stationed prayer warriors in this place, God, whose assignment it would be to do nothing but pray, creating a path for your word to meet his intended destination. Get glory, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. While you're standing, turn, say something nice to your neighbor, make him smile real big. The Gospel of Matthew, I want to get right into my assignment. Matthew chapter 13, Matthew 13, verse 24 through 30. I'm grateful for all of you who are here, all of our pastors, our elders, my beautiful wife, Lady Kim, all of you who are here visiting as well. Matthew 13, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. I want to read verse 24 through 30. And I'm in this series about parables. I'm preaching about the parables of Jesus Christ because there's power in the parables. And I want to share this particular parable this morning. It's found in Matthew 13. I want to begin reading in verse 24, concluding in 30. And I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible. And this is how it reads. It says, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went his way. And when the wheat sprouted and formed a hedge, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you not sow good seed in the field? Where then did these weeds come from? He replied, an enemy did this. The servants then asked him, do you want us to go through the field and pluck up the weeds? But he says, no, verse 29. I don't want you to do that because in pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together unto the harvest. And at that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in a bundle burn then gather up the wheat and bring them into my barn i want to preach this morning for your with your prayers and god's power wheat in the midst of weeds repeat that with me shout wheat in the midst of weeds you may be seated ushers included in the very um, presence of 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 the lord uh, this morning my brothers and sisters our sermonic spotlight it shines on this 13th chapter of mark matthew's narrative and matthew arrests jesus in the position or the posture of teaching parables it's amazing when you study the ministry and the life of jesus christ you will discover that whenever Jesus was in the posture of teaching. Literally thousands of people would gather around to hear him. And the reason why Jesus attracted such a phenomenal crowd when he taught was because every time he opened his mouth to teach, he taught with authority and simplicity. Repeat that with me. Shout authority. Shout simplicity. Jesus, he taught with authority. Because every time he spoke, his words were penetrating. But at the same time, he taught with simplicity because every time he taught, his words were plain. He taught with authority because his words always went directly into the hearts of his listeners. But he taught with simplicity because his words never went over the head of his listeners. And in our text this morning, Jesus is being true to form. He's teaching with power, and he's doing it with a parable. In this particular parable that Jesus is teaching, he's making a point about the kingdom of heaven. And as Jesus is making this point about the kingdom of heaven, he shares a parable of a, of a sower that sowed good seed into his field. After sowing the seed in the field, the Bible says that the man went away, turned his back. And while he was sleeping, an enemy crept into his field and sowed weeds in the midst of the wheat. To make matters worse, Jesus said that by the time people figured out what the enemy had done, it was too late. Because the weeds had then wrapped itself around the wheat and started choking it. Until the, the, the sower had to make a conscious decision. Don't try to uproot the weed, but let the two grow together until harvest time come. 
at the end of teaching this particular parable, late in the day, the disciples came to Jesus Christ privately. Around verse 36, keep your Bibles open. And the Bible said these disciples asked Jesus in verse 36 to explain to them what the parable meant. And between verse 37 and 39, if your Bibles are open, Jesus gave them the particulars in this parable. Jesus said in verse 37 that the sower of the seed represented the son of man. Verse 38, Jesus said the field was the world. He said that the wheat or the seed, it represented or stood for the sons of the kingdom. He said also that the, uh, the, the evil, uh, the wheat represented the sons of, of the evil one or the children of the devil. He said that the evil person or the enemy represented the devil or Satan. And then he said that the harvest was the end of the age and the harvesters were the angels. Are y'all with me today? Jesus explains in detail what the parable and the particulars of the parable, who they are. Now, what's interesting is that when you study this narrative, Mike, don't miss this. When you study this parable, there are several messages mixed in with this one parable parable. There are several lessons to learn. The first lesson that we learn by looking at the parable is that there will be plots made by Satan. What, te what this parable teach us is that regardless of who you are, there will be plots made by Satan. The text teach us that while this sower was busy planting in his field, that the devil was busy plotting on the field. Please understand, regardless of who you are, while you are busy planting, you have an enemy that's busy plotting on you. The Bible clearly tells us in verse 25 that as soon as this man sowed a seed in his field and turned his back, the enemy came in. Please don't be surprised whenever you figure out that there's been people plotting on you. Please don't be caught off guard when you discover that as soon as you turn around, as soon as you turn your head, as soon as you close your eyes, that you have somebody plotting because the text is tailored to teach us that the same time you are planning, you have an enemy uh, that's plotting. The Bible teach us, watch this, the Bible teach us that the enemy uh, is on the way. In fact, touch your neighbors. The neighbors stay woke. Stay woke. Don't, don't st stay woke because you have uh, an enemy. I don't care how nice you try to be. I don't care how you try to mind your own business. Preach, Pastor Jackson. I don't care what efforts you make. You can try to mind your business and leave other business people, businesses alone. But the bottom line is no matter what you do, you're going to have uh, an enemy. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 18 tells us that when the enemy comes in like a flood, uh, the spirit of the Lord shall do what? Lift up a step. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of uh, when. The Bible says that if you're going to glean from this parable, you have to understand, number one, that there are plots being made by Satan. But not only do we learn by looking at this parable that there are plots made by Satan. Uh, the second thing that we learn by looking at this parable is that there are pretenders in your soil. <laughs> Lord, let me preach. That there, there are pretenders in, in the soil. I'm still in verse 25. The text says that not only did this man creep into the man's field, uh, but the text said that he sowed uh, weeds uh, in the midst of uh, the week. Watch the text, Wanda, because this man just didn't sow any kind of tear or any kind of wheat, but he sowed the kind of tear that looked just like wheat. He sowed the kind of weed that pretended to be wheat so much that you couldn't tell the difference between the wheat and the weed until they both had to grow. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. That you, you need to be mindful of the fact that regardless of who you are, everybody in your life is not sovereignly sent, but some are satanically stationed. 
that, that, that the devil has, has the power to position uh, pretenders uh, in your sorrow. I'm talking to somebody right now that know about having pretenders in your sorrow. People that pretend uh, to be your friend but wasn't. People that pretend to have your back but didn't. People that pretend that, that they love you but they couldn't. People that pretended that they'll be there through thick and thin. And when things got thick, they got thin. People that said they were ride or die, but they died before they ride. Help me, somebody. Um, pretenders. Somebody shout pretenders, 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 pretenders in the soil. The text teaches us uh, that there's a very poss a, a, a very uh, distinct possibility that the devil uh, can have pretenders in the soil. Nudge your neighbor. Say, check out your soil. Check your soil check your sorrow. However, when you keep looking at this parable, the greater lesson to be learned by looking at this narrative is not that there are plots made by Satan or that there's pretenders in the soil, but the greatest lesson is that there's power in the seed. In fact, Cheney, what shouted me is that when you look at this text, it teaches us that the power in the seed is greater than the pretenders in the soil and even the plotters by Satan. Are y'all hearing me? That what the text teaches us is that there's so much power in the seed that nothing can come up against it. And the reason why some of y'all are not shouting is because you forgot who I told you the seed represents. Verse 38, Jesus said that the seed are the children of God. Are y'all hearing me? Meaning if you are a child of God, if you walk down these aisles and given a preacher your hand and God your heart and the first friend your name, it means that you represent the children of the kingdom. And if you are the children of the kingdom, in this text teaches us that you are the seed. And I'm saying that there's power in the seed, meaning that there's power inside of you. And just because you don't know who you're sitting beside, help me preach to your neighbor. Tell a neighbor, there's power inside of you. You got the wrong name. You sitting beside the wrong person. There, there, there's power inside of you. You are stronger than you think you are. You have so much power that even though there's pretenders in your soil and there's plots made on you by Satan, you've got something in you that's greater than what's coming up against you. And every now and then, you have to have the ability to celebrate the power that's within you. If nobody else celebrate how strong you are, if nobody else celebrate how phenomenal you are, if nobody else celebrate how strong you are, learn how to wrap your arms around yourself and declare, I'm stronger than I think I am. God, I feel like preaching this morning. Here it is, this power uh, in the seed. And so for the next uh, few moments, I want to unpack this narrative because uh, I want to show you how impressed I was uh, just with the seed. The first thing that impressed me about the seed was this. It had the capacity to flourish. The seed had the capacity um, to flourish. Shout back with me. Say, it had the capacity. The flourish. This seed had the capacity, Alex, to flourish. Uh, what impressed me is in verse number 26. Look at verse 26. But I want you, to, Cedric, to read verse 26. But I want you to look at it in the King James translation of the Bible. Because in verse 26, in the King James version of the Bible, it opens with a contrasting conjunction. It opens uh, by saying, uh, but, come on, stay with me. Verse 26, in the King James version, uh, it opens using the word uh, but this contrasting conjunction, and that shouts me uh, because the but is contrasting uh, the negative activity that's taking place in verse 25. Back up. In verse 25, the Bible says uh, that there were a plot, some plots made by Satan. Uh, there were some pretenders in the soil. Verse 25 says uh, that an enemy crept into the field and sowed weeds in the midst of this man's wheat. However, verse 26 says, uh, but the blade still sprung up, and the blade, said, you don't know when to shout, I'll try it one more time. Verse 25 says uh, that the enemy was trying everything in its power uh, to poison the field. The enemy stationed the pretenders in the soil. The enemy made plots by Satan. Uh, however, verse 26 says, uh, but in all that the enemy 
tried to do, the, bleed, the seed still sprang up and became, let me just give it to you. Can I tell y'all why the enemy is so mad at you? Why the adversary is so frustrated with you? Why the devil is working overtime trying to hinder you? It's because everything he tries to do, you keep popping up and you keep being produ pr productive. No matter what the adversary has tried to do to you, nothing has been able to keep you down. I wish I had somebody that wanted to have church to tell your neighbor, neighbor, they can't keep me down. I don't care how many slander campaigns they launch. I don't care how many lies they tell. I don't care how many pretenders they put around me. I've got something in me that's greater. Nothing can hold me down. Oh, I, can, can, can I preach this thing like I feel it? Uh, what, what impresses me about the seed is the fact that the Bible says, I'm in verse 26, that it sprung up and then it brought forth fruit. Somebody shout, it popped up. Somebody shout, it was productive. The seed, Sister Jones, it popped up. And after the seed popped up, the seed started to produce. Now, this is what shouts me. Because there were some things happening to the seed beneath the soil and some things happening to the seed above the soil. Because the Bible says as soon as the sower planted the seed in the ground, the enemy planted some weeds in the ground. So there was a war going on under the dirt. But then after the seed came out the dirt, the weeds wrapped itself around after the, uh, the wheat. Are y'all hearing me? So there were some things happening behind the scenes uh, and some things happening uh, on the scene. But whatever happened behind the scene uh, and on the scene couldn't stop the seed uh, from busting to the scene. Uh, and that's somebody's testimony right now. That no matter what the adversary has done to you, uh, you keep popping up and you keep being productive. Uh, and just because you don't know who you're sitting beside, give somebody high five uh, and say, neighbor, keep on popping up. Uh, Keep on showing up. Don't let the presence of the wheat, we stop you from showing up. You keep showing up, and guess what? When you show up, have your hair did, have your nails did, have, come on, be looking fly. When you show up, don't show up looking like Raggedy Ann, but when you show up, walk in with swagger, walk in with your head hold up, walk in with your shoulder strut back. Why? Because the enemy can't stop you from popping up and being productive. I, I was thinking about this whole issue of popping up and being productive, and then it dawned on me why America just hate African Americans. It, it, it dawned on me that why, as a black race, we are despised more than any other race. It, it, uh, it hit me. It hit me just this past week. I was in Washington, D.C. I had an opportunity to go to the National Museum, and as I'm walking through the National Museum, starting from the bottom, making my way up to the top, I saw a had a reminder of where our people come from. I had a reminder of the misery of the Middle Passage. I had a reminder of the slavery uh, that our people had to endure. I had a reminder of the Jim Crow laws and the voter suppression. I had a reminder of how dogs were sick on us. I had a reminder of every attempt that this nation has launched against us to keep us down. But then when I got up a little bit higher, I looked up and saw the 44th president uh, of our country, a black man, and then it hit me that no matter what this nation has tried to do to us, they hate us because every time you try to keep us down, some kind of way, we pop up and we produce. And I need a popper up and a producer to jump on your feet right now and declare, nothing can keep me down. Nothing can hinder me. Why? Because I have the capacity to flourish. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you have the capacity to flourish. Sit down. What impressed me about the seed, number one, that the seed, little this, watch this, had the capacity to flourish. But not only did the seed have the capacity to flourish, the second thing that impressed me about this seed was this. It had, watch this, the confidence of the farmer. Yeah, shout that. Shout the confidence of the farmer. Here it is. I'm in verse 28 now. In verse 28, after um, the, 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 the enemy came and, 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 and sowed these weeds in, uh, in the field, um, the Bible says that the servants of the field came to the sower. 
and said, did, did you not sow um, wheat in, in your field? And, and if you did, where did all these weeds come from? He says in verse 29, I'll tell you where it came from. An enemy came and did this. Well, the servant says, I got a plan. Why don't we go and try to separate the wheat? from the weeds. But no, look at what the farmer said in verse number 30. He said, no, don't, don't, don't separate the wheat from the weeds because while trying to uproot the weeds, you may inadvertently uproot the wheat. He says, let them both grow together. Stop right there. That statement, Gwen, impressed me so much so because what the farmer was doing was uh, he was not expressing his cluelessness about the seed. He was expressing his confidence in the seed. The farmer was cognizant that there was something in the soil that was trying to attack the seed. But he was confident that whatever was in the seed, it was stronger than what was after the seed. You see, the confidence of the farmer said, all I got to do is let both of them grow together because I'm confident that no matter where this seed is, this seed going to be all right. Can I give 55 people and I'll be 56 a reason to give God praise? God don't have to remove you from your environment. God don't have to make you change churches. God don't have to make you leave your job because God has so much confidence in you that he can leave you where you are because you can bloom wherever you've been planted. Am I talking to somebody in this house who's told the Lord, Lord, you ain't got to move me. If you leave me right here, I can praise you in this situation. I can give you glory in this situation. I can dance right where I am. Um, um, some of you didn't get it. Um, 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 you, some of you didn't get it. Uh, let me, Lord, how can I say it? Um, um, the barometer of God's confidence is when he knows that what's in you is stronger than what's after you. Somebody better write that down. The barometer of God's confidence in you is when he knows uh, that what's in you is stronger than what's after you. Come on, can you brag on your neighbor and say, neighbor, I got something in me that's stronger than what's after me. That's the wrong neighbor. Tell your other neighbor, neighbor, I've got something that's in me that's stronger than what's after me. The this in me is stronger than that which is after me. I got the wrong crowd. The baby, yo, this has to be stronger stronger than your that. And the problem with some of y'all is uh, you are letting your that affect your this, but you ought to flip the script. Uh, don't let the that affect the this. You got to have the confidence uh, that my this is stronger than that. Okay. Um, 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 the, the, the seven o'clock crowd got it the first time. Um, y'all a little slow. Um, let, let me see if I help you. Um, somebody shout this and that. Um, um, in Job chapter number one, um, 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 there's a conversation between um, Satan and the Lord. Um, 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 verse seven, um, and, th and, and the conversation is about Job. And the discussion is around the fact that Satan thought that Job's this was attached to that. But the Lord said, no, Job's this ain't attached to that. In fact, you can mess with that and his this will stay the same. I got the wrong church. So the devil said, okay, it's a deal. And when you read the story of Job, Eric, you'll discover uh, that Job uh, had everything he messed with, uh, everything he had messed with by the devil. The devil messed with that family he had. The devil messed with that money he was making. The devil messed with that wife he had. The devil messed with that ch those children that Job had. But when the dust settled, uh, Job's this stayed the same. Job said, naked I came into the world, and naked I shall depart. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I need somebody in this house to let the devil know you can mess with that, but this you can't touch. In fact, that problem that I had, I couldn't seem to solve. I prayed and I prayed and I got deeper involved, but when I gave it to the Lord, he worked. I got the wrong church. That pain that would not move, I had to take it to the upper room. That burden that I bore, wondering, Lord, how much more? But when I gave it over to the Lord, he worked that thing out. Why? Because I got 
something in me that's stronger. Am I talking to anybody in this house? Can you help me praise God right there? Because this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. There's power in the seed, Jasper. The seed impressed me, number one, because, watch this, uh, of, of, of its capacity to flourish. It impressed me, secondly, because it had the confidence of the farmer. But, oh, lastly, it impressed me because when you look at verse 30, the seed had a cause for the future. Uh, when, when, I, when I talk about cause, I'm using that word synonymously with, with purpose. Somebody shout purpose. That, that the reason why uh, ultimately the seed couldn't be destroyed by Satan was because it was purpose on his life. I done lost somebody right now. It, it was purpose on, 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 on the seed's life. In fact, uh, when you read verse 30, one more time, I promise I'm almost done this time. When you read verse 30, uh, you'll discover that both the weed and the weed had destiny attached to its life. But the purpose of the weed was to end up in the fire. But the purpose of the wheat was to be used for the future. Uh, the purpose of uh, uh, the weeds were to go into the, to the fire to be burned. But the purpose of the wheat was to be hidden by favor into the barn. Uh, you got to understand, child of God, uh, that this whole attack against your life uh, is really not about your person. Uh, it's about your purpose. Uh, this whole attack against your family, it's about not money. It's about your purpose. Uh, the devil is trying to hinder your purpose. Uh, this whole attack, somebody right now got a child and you scratching your head trying to figure out why the enemy is working overtime on that child. I'll tell you why. Because the adversary knows that there's purpose attached to to that child. Somebody right now is wondering why my marriage, why my relationship is always under attack. I'll tell you why. There's purpose attached to your relationship. And what you have to understand is this, that God has already ordained for a purpose to be attached to the life of the seed. And that seed's purpose was bigger than itself because nobody eat wheat by itself. But wheat is always used as a byproduct to bless somebody else. You don't miss you don't know when to shout. I'm talking to somebody here. God has kept you from the accident. God has preserved you from adversity. God has kept your mind in the midst of adverse situations just because there's purpose on your life. And if you know there's purpose on your life, sometimes you got to praise God just for God picking you for purpose. Sometimes you got to hold your hand up and tell God, thank you for using me for something bigger than myself. I got the enemy coming up against me. I got people pretending in my life. I got Satan plotting on my life. But thank God for power. I have a power that's on the inside that's greater than that's coming after me. And if I'm talking to somebody here, somebody help me give God glory just for the purpose that's on your life. Just for God using you to bless somebody else. Just for God using you for a plan that's bigger than you and because there's purpose the bullet can't kill me because there's purpose stress won't take me out because there's purpose I won't throw in the towel because there's purpose I won't wave the white flag because there's purpose I won't commit suicide because there's purpose I won't walk away because there's purpose I'm gonna stand still and see the glory of the Lord because there's purpose I ain't going no where. Because there's purpose. The harder you knock me down, the higher I'm about to back up. Because I got purpose, I'll cry one night, but weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. Because I got purpose, when my friends get few, I ain't going nowhere. Because I got purpose, when my money runs out, I'm going to stand still and trust God. Give somebody a high five and tell Neighbor, I got purpose. There's purpose on my life. And there's somebody here who feel like you're wheat in the midst of weeds. But oh, child of God, you hang on in there because God has confidence in you that even in the midst of weeds, 
you're going to be all right. I know you don't know who you're sitting beside, but do me a favor. Just reach over and encourage your neighbor. Tell him, hang on in there. Hang on. Hang on. Come on, encourage him. Come on, encourage him. Come on, encourage him. Come on, encourage him. Come on, you into it. Come on, encourage him. Man, listen. There's so much power in you. Somebody need prayer. Huh? If you're here and you're that seed and you feel that that environment you're in is so toxic, is on the verge of taking you out, come to the altar now and